Well, good evening. Thank you for tuning in to the Lessons of Vietnam show. Uh, on the Vietnam, uh, where we do our lessons of Vietnam, we're trying to tell the true story of what went on in Vietnam. And I am your host, Bill Dixon. And Emma, if we can have, go ahead and have the first slide, and we'll get started with it. Okay. Uh, I was froze there for a minute. There we go. Whoops. Okay. While we're on this one, uh, if you are a veteran, you know of a veteran, uh, or you think there's a veteran who is in distress, please reach out and give them the number we had there, uh, the 1-800-273-8255, press 1. It's important they press 1, and somebody there is to talk to them. Uh, it's, 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 it's kind of a disease that's hard to see, is uh, depression and post-traumatic stress. Again, with us is the Lessons of the Vietnam show, where we tell the, uh, telling the true story of the Vietnam War as best we can. Uh, if you uh, think there's something we say that's not right, please let us know. And as I mentioned, we, I am your host, Bill Dixon, Vietnam veteran 67 and 68. I've been back three other times. We are broadcasting courtesy of Nissan Communications and uh, from their world headquarters on the edge of Raleigh and Cary, North Carolina. If you have any comments and suggestions, after the show, just contact me at dixonbill80 at yahoo.com. Uh, I've got a couple of people that always uh, uh, reach out to me and we uh, send back and forth and talk about the shows that were there, uh, their questions and so forth. Uh, to participate in the show while it's live, uh, I'd like you to come in on 919-518-9773 or on Skype at computers. 2k voice that way you can come in during the show make a comment or whatever and be part of the show and uh we're always looking for uh people who come on and and, and straighten us out where we made our mistake as we're getting right into the show tonight because i got a lot to go over this is part three understand the vietnam war and this is kind of an incoming rant from a frustrated vietnam veteran victory is ours but we were not allowed to win by Mr. Tom Fryer on Vietnam 65 and 66. And I really enjoyed reading the piece that he sent me. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit on another show, uh, some of the things he's got. But we're going to start out with the Tet Offensive, uh, which is uh, just going on right now. Uh, we basically got cleared out Saigon, but way still under, uh, under siege. Uh, the Tet Offensive showed another side of the war to Americans, one which they did not like. The coordination, strength, and surprise instigated by the comments led to the United States to realize that their foe was much stronger than they had expected. In actuality, the Tet Offensive was a military victory and a turning point in the war for the U.S. and Arvin. Everybody talks about how uh, smart General Jip was. If an American general had lost as many people uh, killed in the war uh, in America, they had to fire him and shot him. Uh, but Jip, Jip was called a, uh, a hero and uh, great technician. If you keep right on sending people out to die, uh, it's, you can be a great technician. Uh, it was reported throughout the South Vietnam that local officials and commanders gained confidence as it began uh, apparent that the Viet Cong were effectively finished as a fighting force. In other words, the South Vietnamese officers, commanders, uh, village chiefs and all, uh, they knew that it was a basically a a uh, big loss for the Viet Cong. They were feeling better. However, uh, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong were unquestionably defeated during the Tet Offensive. Somebody forgot to tell our, our news media. In the first week of the Tet attack, the NVA, North Vietnamese Army, and Viet Cong lost 32,204 confirmed kill, 5,803 captured, U.S. losses, 1,015 killed in action, while Arvin losses were 2,819 killed. Arvin losses were higher because the NVA BC, reluctant to enter into a battle with U.S. forces, attacked targets defended almost exclusively by South Vietnamese troops. And you remember there was a uh, there was a Tet truce. A lot of the South Vietnamese soldiers had uh, gone on leave for the family thing, so. Uh, the Arvin place, the Arvin bases and so forth that were guarding you know, some of our bases, Arvin, uh, were light. So uh, that was one of the reasons they wanted to attack it. But with the, all the NBA and VC losses, 
Would one think it was a turning point for the U.S. and armed forces? General Westmoreland had requested 206,000 additional troops, and the president declined uh, to commit. Rather taking advantage of our Tet Offensive victories and striking going, to, going for the snake's head by taking the war to Hanoi, Johnson caved to the criticism by the noted nightly TV reporters, anti-war protesters, and to eroding public support for his handling of the war. He might have ended the war right there. Everybody was talking about how the BC got into the American embassy. Uh, the little picture there, it kind of can show you the hole that was blown into the uh, courtyard wall of the embassy. Uh, that's a close up of it. Uh, you can see the embassy. Uh, the uh, eight or nine uh, Viet Cong who got in never got out of the courtyard. But that's a close up picture of the hole they blew. You can see it's not that big. Uh, uh, they're standing there looking at, at the body of one of the Viet Cong in that little uh, fountain area behind them, the guy sitting on Okay. President Lyndon B. Johnson decided to end the escalation of U.S. involvement in Vietnam conceded the, and, and conceded the war. He went on TV on March 31st, 1968, and announced a bombing halt to the North and America's willingness to meet with the North Vietnamese to seek a peace settlement. Here we are, we just won the battle. And now all of a sudden we want to get the, um, uh, uh, talk to him about peace. In June 1968, down his ability to command, Westmoreland is replaced by General Creighton Abel. Then on October 31st, 1968, Johnson ordered a complete halt to all air, naval, and artillery bombardment of North Vietnam. And the Rolling Thunder campaign launched in 1965 came to an end. Robert McNamara resigned. Once again, we must ask the important why question. Why was the 1968 Tet Offensive portrayed as a victory and turning point in the war for the North Vietnamese by American press and a Democrat-controlled Congress? Now it became apparent that the actual political motive for the war wasn't to stop the spread of communism in Southeast Asia, but for, uh, but for those reasons already discussed, the primary reason is found in 1967-68 congressional records. In reality, it became the turning point for the Democratic-controlled Congress. They wanted to end the war to finance their war on poverty and the great society. Victories? The Ken Burns Vietnam War document also kept the American people in the dark on this subject. Although Tet Offensive was an American victory, our intelligence efforts for failure to predict its coming is blamed on both Johnson and Westmoreland. It is reported that the Tet Offensive buildup began in mid-1967, which ultimately saw seven regiments and 20 battalions move south along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But isn't this understandable now, knowing the crippling rules of engagement and not shutting down this trail? Why did Johnson change course? All the moderate Democrats who had voted to send troops into South Vietnam turned into born again left wing radicals, claiming they had always opposed the war. However, it was reported they lost a political will on the part of the Democratic Party, not a military defeat, which caused the downfall of South Vietnam. But the truth was, in 1967 68, when the war did end as promised, the Democratic members of Congress took to the floor warning Johnson to end the war so they could finance the war on poverty for their victories. Read the 67 68 congressional records. The president declined to commit the 206,000 additional troops which General Westmoreland had requested. On March 31st, 1968, he announced a curb in the bombing of North Vietnam. The primary reason is found in the 1967 68 congressional record. In reality, it became the turning point for the Democratic-controlled Congress. All the moderate Democrats who had voted to send troops in South Vietnam turned into born-again left-wing radicals claiming they had always opposed the war. However, it was reported the loss of political will on the part of the Democratic Party, not a military defeat which caused the downfall of South Vietnam. In reality, a war interfered with Democratic cash flow to implement the socialist program and their recent war on poverty. 
rather than take advantage of our Tet offensive victories and striking while going for the snake's head and taking the war to Hanoi, Johnson caved to the criticism by the noted nightly TV reporters, the anti-war protesters, and to the eroding public support for his handling of the war. President Lyndon B. Johnson decided to end the escalation of U.S. involvement in Vietnam, conceding the war. He went on TV on March 31, 1968, and announced a bombing halt of the North, North, North and America's willingness to meet with the North Vietnamese to seek a peace settlement. Peak troop strength in Vietnam, 543,482 in April 30, 1968. In June 1968, Dallas' ability to command Westmoreland is replaced by General Craig Naiman, as we discussed. October 31, 1968, Johnson ordered a complete halt to all air, naval, and artillery bombardment of North Vietnam, and the Rolling Thunder campaign launched in 1965 came to an end. Through the bombing halts were going on to encourage Hanoi to, to discuss a, politi a political settlement. In other words, we're going we're gonna to quit bombing you and, and hope that you decide that, we, that you're losing the war if we quit bombing you and you're going to come to uh, peace terms. Rolling Thunder, which was the big bombing campaign, was a solid military operation in theory, but a costly failed operation. We were armed to the teeth, but we had a bridle bit in the mouth, and the reins were attached to Johnson and McNamara, all going back to what we talked about the last show, the rules of engagement. Rolling Thunder was the code name for an American bombing campaign from March 1965 to October 1968, in which U.S. military aircraft attacked targets throughout North Vietnam. The goal was to put pressure on North Vietnam's to reduce their ability to wage war and to come to the peace table. Action was sound in theory, but it was costly, a failed operation because of Johnson's restraining rules of engagement already discussed. Those rules forced a disadvantage of our Air Force and provided an artificial advantage to North Vietnam. Additionally, Johnson's bombing halts allowed the North to rebuild its strength, repair damage, and send more troops and supplies to the battle zones in the South. The first rolling thunder bombing that halt lasted six days. May 1965, on December 24, 1965, President Johnson declared another bombing halt that lasted until June, January 30, 1966. So when Rolling Thunder missions were resumed, the U.S. pilots not only had to attack new targets, but they also had, previous, had they also those previously destroyed during the bombing halts. In other words, deja vu all over again. March 1968, President Johnson halts bombing in Vietnam north of the 20th parallel. After several months of discussion at Paris, on October 31st, 1968, Johnson ordered a complete halt to all air, naval, and artillery bombing of North Vietnam, and the Rolling Thunder campaign came to an end. Operation Rolling Thunder is singled out because it, it supports that the high aim of the war during the Johnson administration was not the destruction of any of his armed forces and end the war in a timely manner. And the October 31st, 1968, Holland the Bomb was the desperate move just before 1968 elections. The bombings paid reverence revenue to the war merchants. It played Hanoi's goal to prolong the war for as long as it could while inflicting casualties, running at the cost of the war, and the American public would exert pressure on their leaders to end the war. If you're not going to bomb major military targets, why waste money in the tonnage? If you're not going to bomb the Soviet-supplied air defense system in the Haiphong Harbor, why sacrifice our pilots and aircraft? If you're not going to bomb the supply and troop trains coming out of China, why prolong the war and disregard our precious lives? It was reported throughout the three and a half year Rolling Thunder bombings campaign, U.S. dropped a million tons of bomb on North Vietnam, equivalent of 800 tons per day, with little actual success in halting the flow of soldiers and supplies in the South when damaging North Vietnamese morale. In fact, the opposite has occurred as the North Vietnamese have politically rallied around their communist leaders as a result of the onslaught. 
During Rolling Thunder, North Vietnam's sophisticated Soviet-supplied air defense systems managed to shoot down 922 U.S. aircraft during 2,380 sorties flown by B-52 bombers and over 300,000 sorties by U.S. Uh, as a result of the crippling rules of engagement over the three and a half years of Rolling Thunder was a failure. By the time the United States ended its Southeast Asian bombing campaigns, the total tonnage of ordnance dropped approximately triple the totals of World War II. The end of Chinese bombing amounted to 7,662,000 tons of explosives, compared to 2,150,000 tons in the, war, in, the war, in the world complex of World War II. The war merchant machines certainly got built the rich at the cost of our brothers and sisters' lives. Note. China's foreign policy in Southeast Asia on May 16, 1989, China admitted that it had sent 320,000 combat troops to Vietnam to fight against U.S. forces and the South Vietnamese allies. The real number may never be known. There were a number of estimates as high as 600,000 Chinese who fought in Vietnam. In a report monitored in Hong Kong, the semi-official China News Service said China sent soldiers to Vietnam during the 1960s and spent over 20 billion to support Hanoi's regular North Vietnamese army and Viet Cong guerrilla units. China supported their communist ally in Vietnam, peaking in 1967 with about 170,000. To this day, there's much speculation about exactly how much China spent in the war and how many soldiers were actually provided and how many were killed. And we were worried about China might come into war. Nixon inherited Johnson Bonner and had to manage the war under the watchful eye and heavy foot of a Democratic-controlled Congress. Was Nixon unjustly branded as, the one of the, as one of the scapegoats of the war? In his defense, it's necessary to add his timeline to, to prove the false claims because the veteran brotherhood is divided as to his role in the Vietnam War. Many veterans believe the false narrative that Nixon is depicted as the media portrayed him, portrayed him, excuse me, a cold-blooded, calculating politician more interested in re-election than lives of U.S. troops in combat, and that he extended the war for political purposes. Also, the discussions about Nixon and the Wall Street bankers profiting off the war. Now, it is known that during the peace talks, Nixon, before the election, Nixon did go and talk to the communists uh, and tell them to hold off on signing the peace treatment until he got elected because he'd give them a better deal. That, that is uh, also known. We have already seen who profited from the war. In history 108 of the Vietnam War, it had been evaluated and recommended for a three credit hours course. Nixon perpetrated a tactic known by the press as the madman theory or used an unpredictability to psychologically terrorize North Vietnam into accepting an agreement. Renowned Prussian General Clausewitz would have added this to his book on war if it was possible. While Johnson had complete freedom to run the war on the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, you have clearly seen that he, Johnson, not Nixon, was the billion of the war. Billion of the war. Nixon inherited Johnson's chaos, and he was wrongly branded because he had to manage the war under the heavy foot of Democrat-controlled Congress, an ever-decreasing troop strength. Vietnam veteran and retired Marine, uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North on Ken Burns' PBS documentary said, I had the opportunity to brief former President Nixon on numerous occasions and came to admire his analysts of current events, insights on world affairs and compassion for our troops. His preparation for any meeting or discussion was exhaustive. His thirst for information was unquenchable and his tolerance for fools was non-existent. Mr. Nixon's prosecution of war in Southeast Asia is poorly told by Ken Burns in his new public broadcasting service documentary, The Vietnam War. That is but one of the many reasons Mr. Burns' latest work is such a disappointment and a tragic lost opportunity. Yet he is portrayed 
in the Burns documentary as a cold-blooded, calculating politician more interested in re-election than lives with troops in combat. Contrary to the documentary's portrayal, Mr. Nixon had a complicated strategy to achieve peace with honor. His goal was to train and equip the South Vietnamese military to defend their own country in a process he called Vietnamization, and thereby withdraw American troops. Obviously, after reading the deep, uh, the deceitful fabrication called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, Johnson's crippling rules of engagement and his not listening to the military minds of the day it is clear that it wasn't Nixon who betrayed the troops. It was clear Johnson and the Democratic-controlled Congress. It was Johnson who was a cold-blooded, calculating politician who was not interested in the lives of U.S. troops in combat. But remember what was going on during the election campaign of 1968. The Tet Offensive, January 30, 1968, an outright victory for the U.S. was depicted by the media as a, as a success and turning point for Hanoi. In the following timeline, it will become evident that Democratic-controlled Congress passed several resolutions that restricted Nixon and the use of troops and air power in Southeast Asia. Let's look at Nixon's timeline. On January 20th, 1969, Nixon took office and inherited Johnson's chaos. March 5th, 1969, congressional record. Congress must be clear. Get us out of Vietnam now. For the urgency of our crisis here at home demands your full energies and preoccupation. More importantly, exercise of the only power Congress has to regulate the conduct of foreign policy, the power of the purse. If Congress refused the appropriate additional funds to pr prosecute the war, the president will have to withdraw troops because we have no alternative. What was the urgency of our crisis here at home that a Democratic-controlled Congress spoke of? They wanted to bail out the war to use the power of the purse to implement the war on poverty initiatives. March 1969 to May 1970, Operation Menu. U.S. B-52 bombers targeted suspected communist base camps and supply zones in Cambodia. Democrats said this was an illegal bombing mission and were ready to impeach Nixon. During the invasion of Cambodia in the spring of 1970, the Senate voted to repeal the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and to cut off funds for the operation after June 30th. In April 1970, President Nixon announced a plan to draft 150,000 additional soldiers to send to Cambodia in hopes of cutting off supply chains in North Vietnam. He was rejected by the Democratic-controlled Congress. This should have been done in 1965 under Johnson. In June of 1970, by the 94th Congress, a Democratic control Congress repealed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution during the invasion of Cambodia in the spring of 1970. The Senate voted to repeal the Gulf of Tonkin, Tonkin Resolution to cut off funds for the operation after June 30th. It took away the free reign to wage war that was given to L uh, Lyndon Johnson from the Nixon administration. In June 1970, the 94th Congress also restricted U.S. cross-border operation into Laos and Cambodia. In January of 1971, a Democratic-controlled Congress votes to withdraw all troops by the end of the year. The Senate passed a resolution on June 21st to withdraw all remaining 244,900 troops by the end of the year. That was 1971. If you follow the timeline of Nixon's first year in office, it's clear that he did have to manage the war under the watchful eye and heavy foot of the Democratic-controlled Congress. Nixon was doing and wanting to do what the military brain trust wanted to do in 1965. They could not allow Nixon to succeed where they had failed so shamefully. Speaking of the Congress. On June 13, 1971, the Pentagon Papers, a top-secret classified document, was leaked. A Department of Defense 7,000 page study of U.S. political and military involvement in Vietnam from 1945 to 1967. It was leaked to the New York Times. It was published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other newspapers. It could not implicate the Nixon administration because it covered it through 1966. However, 
the intentional leak of the paper's content caused the calculated outrage and uproar with the American public to end the war in a political party that a political party desired. But in 1971, opinion polls showed that 66% of all Americans wanted the Vietnam War to end as quickly as possible. January 25th, 1972, Nixon and Nguyen Van Hu announced an eight-point peace plan for ending the war. The proposal is snubbed by North Vietnam. It was obvious to Hanoi that the Democratic-controlled Congress wanted the battle out of the war. Had Nixon under their, and had Nixon under their thumb with ever decreasing troop strength and the leaked Pentagon papers caused an outrage at home. On December 1972, linebacker two, Nixon lifts Johnson's crippling rules of engagement. The campaign named linebacker two saw the use of B-52s over Hanoi and Hanapong for the first time during the war in a truly strategic air campaign. The whole range of U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy tactical air power was employed, the bombing of major targets in Hanoi. The intervention in Cambodia and the remining of Haiphong Harbor, all these acts brought Hanoi back to the peace table. I'm not you there. Strange things going on. While we're uh, waiting for the slide to change. What do you mean? You don't see the slide change? No. What does this one, the one you're looking at, what does it start I'm gonna, with? I'm going to read it again. And, and uh, January 25th. Yeah. Nixon, uh, no, 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 no. I'm looking at one that says January 27th. Okay, well, I don't have that one. Do they change? No. Something happened on your machine. Okay. Uh, folks, we uh, sorry about that. We'll get it fixed in a minute and be right there. Try, um, I mean, I see you fine. Okay. There you go. It went that time. It went that time. All right. Moving right along, folks. Sorry about that. We um, that's one of the problems of being, uh, me being in one place and am not being in another place, and you are wherever you are. Keep going. January twenty seventh, nineteen seventy three. As a result, linebacker two, the Paris Peace Accords negotiated by Henry Kissinger are signed by the U.S., North Vietnam, and South Vietnam, and the Viet Cong. Under the terms of the U.S. agreement, to immediately halt all military activity and withdraw all remaining military personnel within 60 days. The North Vietnamese agreed to an immediate ceasefire and the release of all American POWs within 60 days. Nixon had promised peace with honor. Nixon had entered the draft, reinstituted the voluntary army and eventually brought the, all, all the Americans back July 17, 1973. On June 19, 1973, Congress passed the Case Church Amendment which called for a halt to all military activities in South Vietnam, Southeast Asia by August 15th, thereby ending 12 years of direct U.S. involvement in the region. July 17, 1973, Defense Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger testified before the Armed Forces Committee that 3,500 bombing raids were launched into Cambodia to protect American troops by targeting NBA positions. The extent of Nixon's secret bombing campaign angered many Democrats in Congress and resulted in the first call for Nixon's impeachment. Where's the logic of giving Johnson full authority for a military action without declaring war? A blank check to do, some, do so, supporting his crippling rules of engagement. But Nixon was hampered every step of the way. November 7, 1973, over Nixon's veto. A Democratic-controlled Congress passes the War Powers Resolution requiring Nixon to attain the support of Congress within 90 days of sending American troops abroad. Congress let Johnson get away with not seeking their support. Remember, Congress supported the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution with the assumption that President Johnson would turn and seek their support before engaging in additional escalations of the war. 
Johnson also ordered the bombings of North Vietnam without seeking support from Congress. On January 27th, 1973, the Paris Peace Accords negotiated by Henry Kissinger signed by the U.S., North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and the Viet Cong under the terms the U.S. agrees to immediately halt all military services and withdraw all remaining military personnel within 60 days. And as an important part of, uh, on that part was, yes, we had to get all the Americans out, but it was okay to leave North Vietnamese soldiers in South Vietnam in locations. The North Vietnamese agreed to an immediate ceasefire and the release of all American PDOWs within 60 days. By the way, Friday is the uh, anniversary of the Operation Homecoming, where the first Americans who were coming home in 1973 was this coming Friday. During the invasion of Cambodia in the spring of 1970, the Senate voted to repeal the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution to cut off funds for the operation after the 30th of June. From 1973 to 1975, Congress passed several revolutions, resolutions, that restrict the use of troops and air power in Southeast Asia and rejected presidential requests for further aid to South Vietnam. In the summer of 1970, Congress did finally repeal the uh, Tonkin uh, Gulf Resolution while also restricting U.S. cross-border operations to Laos and Cambodia, which was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Then in 1973, under President Richard Nixon's veto, it even passed the War Powers Act. It took away the free reign to wage war that was given to Lyndon Johnson from the Nixon administration. Nixon's first reaction since the army had crushed the Vietnamese in the aftermath of Tet was to break the will of the enemy. Nixon's instincts led him into the Christmas bombing of, in 72. The bombing of Hanoi, the intervention in Cambodia and the mining of Haiphong Harbor. All these acts came just short of crippling North Vietnam. And then just the war was about to be won, Kissinger signed the peace accords. Nixon began doing what the military brain trust wanted to do in 1965, when it was disallowed by Johnson. If you follow Nixon's timeline in office, it's clear to see that he certainly had to manage the war under the watchful eye and heavy foot of Democratic-controlled Congress. They could not allow Nixon to win the war for they had failed so shamefully on their own. Then you began to see that it sets the stage to question motives for the Pentagon Papers. Why was it written in 1967 and leaked in 1971? And as we move forward, Victor Lasky's book, it didn't start with Watergate, shines a light on another event, the so-called Watergate scandal. And all of the dishonesties from the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution to the end of the war being credibly, which brings credibility to Lasky. He said, they decided they would get Nixon if they could. And so it happened that the Democrats in Congress and the media elites colluded in what amounted to a coup d'etat, the first and so far the only one in American history. The author contends that Watergate was a mainly a media event, points to Democratic scandals which had been relatively ignored, and claims that leading Democrats were fully aware of plans for the break-in and did nothing to prevent it. Nixon didn't have to, but felt he was forced to resign. Let's talk about the Pentagon Papers. A far-fetched deception, an alibi for failure, yet a forged passport to escape accountability. The complete declassified Pentagon Papers can be found in the National Archives. However, for brevity and a basic understanding of the Pentagon Papers, let's cut and paste the simplified summary and definition in the 26 facts found in today's students' Pentagon Papers facts for kids. Most of our veterans today do not have an understanding of the Pentagon Papers. About the 26 facts found in today's history of the students' Pentagon Papers really facts or an attempt to brainwash. What was the real reason for, number one, commissioning the Pentagon Papers? And number two, leaking the papers in 1971. We know now it was Johnson's war and he had not been honest. Johnson, McNamara, and their circle of managers politicized, misrepresented, and mishandled the war. The blame for fabrications, failures, and fiascos of the war cannot be shared. So let's cut to the chase and expose the Pentagon Papers' maliciousness 
and scrutinize some of the 26 facts in today's biased account of the Pseudo's Pentagon Papers. What's all the hell do about? But first of all, it's important to understand the Americanists surrounding the Pentagon Papers when it was commissioned in June of 1967. Were things becoming to come apart at the seams? An election year was approaching and Johnson's popularity was on the slide. After the 1968 Tet Offensive with no end to the war in sight, a Gallup poll in March 1968 reported that a clear majority of middle America had turned against the administration. The same poll showed that Johnson's approval rating had react, reached a new low of 30%. General Westmoreland seemed oblivious to the growing hostility of the American people and Congress towards the war. He insisted that Congress had been dealt a crippling blow during the Tet and the war could be won by launching new ground offensive against their bases in Laos and Cambodia and North Vietnam, and by intensifying and expanding the bombing campaign, especially around Hanoi and Hanafong. To implement this strategy, Westmoreland requested an additional 206,000 troops. Johnson had told Congress up front that war was going to be over in two to three years. There was apprehension about losing congressional control in the presidency. Wonderful thing to an election year. In 1967, there were no signs of an end to the cost of the Vietnam War, and there was desperation in the Democrats' aisles of Congress in the war. The Democratic hawks in Congress had turned to doves. In the first session of the 89th Congress, Johnson had pushed his massive, the war on poverty legislation through Congress. However, there were no funds available to implement these victories. The cost of the Vietnam War, if reported correctly, rose from 103 million annually to, in 1965, to 22 billion in the year 1967. So in March of 1967, the Senate held hearings on the war on poverty. Why? Why? It was an attempt to generate national interest in renewing funding for the war on poverty legislation. They needed tax dollars for implement implementation. Extensive media coverage of the event exposed the American public to instances of malnutrition and starvation in Mississippi. With the help of the press, they made a poverty a national issue. They were not concerned about winning the Vietnam War, but their top priority was about their power of the purse to finance their socialistic victories in the war on poverty. I think we're still fighting that war. If you're in doubt, read some of the Democrats' speeches in 1967 in congressional record. But don't you also think Johnson wanted to save face, using the Pentagon Papers to salvage some shreds of his political legacy? Sure, President Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy all had foreign policy in Southeast Asia. When Kennedy took office, uh, military personnel in Vietnam was close to 900. By the end of 1961, it had 3,164, and by the, time, by the time in 1963 of his assassination, it had risen to 16,263. But it became Johnson's war with his actual deployment of American combat forces in March of 1965. There were 16,263 American troops in Vietnam at the start of 1964. By the end of 1965, there were 180,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam, and by the end of 1960, the figure doubled. In 1968, American presidents peaked to 549,500. It was Johnson's war, for he had a free reign, a blank check, and used incredible deception to run the war. Let's look at the 26 found, the facts found in today's history of the students' Pentagon Papers facts. Are they all really facts? Pentagon Papers Facts for Kids, Summary and Definition. The Pentagon Papers was the name given to a secret Department of Defense 7,000 page study of US political and military involvement in Vietnam from 1945 to 1967. The top secret Pentagon Papers were leaked by whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg to the New York Times newspaper in March of 1971. The Pentagon Papers revealed that the U.S. government had not been honest, had used incredible deception, and that decisions about the Vietnam War had been made without the consent of Congress. But in a triple way, as was always already uncovered, Johnson had not been honest and had used incredible deception. It was 
the Democratic controlled Congress that had given him power to act on, not the Americans' behalf, but their behalf, and with that blank check to run the war. Let's scrutinize some of the 26 facts in today's biased account of the pursuit of the Pentagon Papers. Pentagon Papers Facts 1. What were the uh, Pentagon Papers? A United States government 7,000 page, 47 volume report on the internal planning and policy decisions within the U.S. government regarding the Vietnam War. Pentagon Fact 2. The official title of the report was United States Vietnam Relations 1945 and 1967, a study prepared for the Department of Defense, but would become famously known as the Pentagon Papers. According to the National Archives, the Pentagon Papers officially titled report of the Office of Secretary of Defense of the of Defense Vietnam Task Force was commissioned by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in 1967. In June of 1971, small portions of the report were leaked to the press and widely distributed. However, the publication of the report was that resulted from these leaks was incomplete and suffered from many quality issues. Pentagon Papers Fact 3. Who commissioned the Pentagon Papers? The report was commissioned in 1967. Why did Robert McNamara commission the report? McNamara was frustrated with the stalemate of the Vietnam War and warned to leave a comprehensive analysis about U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War for succeeding in administrative orders to prevent future policy errors. Also to cover his butt. First, of all considered the sources, McNamara was Johnson's right-hand man and caught up in the major deception and failures of the war. McNamara, frustrated with the stalemate of the Vietnam War, is preposterous after discovering the armor-plated truths of the war already presented. They did not find or seek victory. And isn't it a coincidence that the U.S. That the CBS commentator Walter Cronkite had been in Vietnam right after the attack assault began? Coming home, he told his listeners, to say that we are mired in stalemate seemed the only realistic yet unsatisfactory conclusion. In reality, we know that the Tet Offensive January 30th, 1968, an outright victory for the U.S. was depicted by the media as a massive psychological and political victory for the communists. So why would CBS commentator Cronkite and McNamara be willing to leave a comprehensive analysis about U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War for succeeding administrations in order to prevent future policy errors is pathetic? Pentagon Papers 4. Facts. Who compiled the Pentagon Papers? Uh, work began on June 17, 1967, by the Vietnam Study Task Force, under the direction of Leslie Gelb. I probably spelled, uh, pronounced that wrong, but that's okay. Uh, the top secret Pentagon Papers was compiled by a team of 36 military officers, analysis, historians, and civilian policy experts. One of the team was military analysis Daniel Ellsberg. When it was leaked in 1971, the intent was to whip up anti-war fervor to end the war. And when you understand who the main cast of characters were, the roles they played before, during, and after the war, who compiled the papers, and who was com com complicit in this dissemination, it's easy to understand it was all deception. Let's look at the cast of characters. Johnson McNamara's dishonest character are well known beforehand. It was Johnson's war encircled by his advisors and supported by Democratic in Congress. Background Lester Gelb, who also oversaw the Pentagon Papers, he worked in government in the mid to late 1960s and oversaw the Defense Department's project to assemble his, a history of American involvement in Vietnam. Gelb's future employer, the New York Times. They would later publish a series of articles in 1971. He served as Assistant Secretary of State in the Carter administration from 1977 to 1979 and rejoined the New York Times in 1981. One of his quotes, the failure of Vietnam could be laid at the door of American foreign policy, but the decisions that led to the failure were made by presidents aware of the risk, clear about their aims, knowledge about the weakness of their allies and under no illusion about the outcome. 
Now, some background on Daniel Ellsberg, who was a military analysis and was the leaker of the Pentagon Papers. Ellsberg served in the Pentagon from August 1964 until Second Defense Robert McNamara, and in fact was on duty the evening of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, reporting the incident to McNamara. He then served for two years in Vietnam, working for General Edward Lansdale as a civilian in the State Department. After serving in Vietnam, Ellsberg resumed working at RAND. They did a lot of, uh, a lot of work, uh, study and so forth. In 1967, he contributed to a top secret study of classified documents regarding the conduct, conduct of the Vietnam War that had been commissioned by Defense Secretary McNamara. These documents completed in 1968 later became known collectively as the Pentagon Papers. It was because Ellsberg held an extremely high level security clearance and desired to create a further a further synthesis from this re their research effort that he was on one of the few individuals who had access to the complete set of Pentagon uh, documents. Pentagon Papers Fact 5. What do the Pentagon Papers consist of? The report consisted of 4,000 pages of actual documents taken from the 1945-1967 period of the Vietnam War and 3,000 pages of analysis. The classified study was so secret it was completed without the knowledge of President Lyndon Johnson or his Secretary of State, Dean Rusk. Pentagon Papers Fact 6. What did the Pentagon Papers reveal? The Pentagon Papers revealed that President Harry S. Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and their administration had deliberately deceived the American people by escalating the Vietnam War while publicly stating the opposite. Sure, President Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy all had foreign policy in Southeast Asia. When Kennedy took office, military personnel in Vietnam was close to 900. By the end of 1961, he had 3,164. And by the time in 1963 of his assassination, he had risen to 16,263. But it became Johnson's war with the actual form of American forces in 1965. There were 16,263 American troops in Vietnam at the start of 1964. By the end of 1965, 180,000 U.S. troops in Vietnam, and by the end of 1966, the figure had doubled. In 1968, American presence peaked at 549,500. It was Johnson's war had not been honest, and he had been used incredible deception to deceive Congress. Pentagon Papers Fact 7. The Pentagon Papers reveal that the Harry S. Truman administration gave military aid to France in its war against the communist Viet Minh which led to this direct involvement of the United States in Vietnam. Pentagon Papers Fact 8. The Pentagon Papers revealed that the Dwight D. Eisenhower administration, immersed in the Cold War, decided to undermine the new communist regime in, of North Vietnam and prevent a communist takeover of South Vietnam. Pentagon Papers Fact 9. The Pentagon Papers revealed that the John F. Kennedy administration changed the Vietnam policy of limited risk ammo to a policy of broad commitment. In reality, the broad commitment came when Johnson escalated the war with combat troops. Pentagon Papers Fact 10. The Pentagon Papers revealed that as President Lyndon Johnson was promising not to expand the Vietnam War, the U.S. government was deliberately expanding its role in Vietnam by sending U.S. combat troops with raids on the coast of North Vietnam attacks by U.S. Marine Corps and airstrikes against Laos, Johnson had made up his mind to send U.S. combat troops to Vietnam. Pentagon Papers Fact 11. Robert McNamara left the Defense Department in, June, in February 1968 and his successor, Clark M. Clifford, received a finished study on January 15, 1969, five days before the inauguration of President Richard Nixon. The report was called classified as top secret sensitive and only 15 copies were published with limited access. Pentagon Papers Fact 12. The Pentagon Papers only covered the period in, in Vietnam up to 1967 and did not implicate the Nixon administration. Pentagon uh, Facts 13. A member of the team who compiled the Pentagon Papers, Daniel Eckberg, knew it contained evidence of a quarter century of aggressive broken treaties, deception, and stolen elections, lies, and murder. And it desperately wanted the Vietnam War to end. Pentagon Papers Fact 14. Ellsberg, assisted by other team members called Anthony Russo, 
began to photocopy large sections of the study with the intention of becoming a whistleblower and exposing the content. Pentagon Papers, Fact 15. Daniel Ellsberg approached several members of Congress, including Senator Fulbright and Senator McGovern, in the hope that they would, be, uh, would debate the report of Congress and enter the Pentagon Papers in the congressional records. All of the senators declined. Wonder why. Pentagon Paper 16. In March 1971, taking advice from Senator McGovern, Daniel Ellsberg made the decision to approach Neil Sheehan, a New York Times reporter, and show him the Pentagon Papers. Pentagon Papers Fact 17. The first of a series of articles based upon the leaked Pentagon Papers was published by the New York Times on June 13, 1971. Pentagon Papers 18. President Nixon was not unduly worried about the first publication as the Pentagon Papers focused more on the errors of their predecessors rather than on him. Nixon was also promoting the policy of Vietnamization aimed at withdrawing U.S. troops from Vietnam. However, Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor, was extremely concerned and convinced Nixon that the article could destroy American credibility forever. Pentagon Papers Fact 19. The New York Times was slapped with an injunction ordering a stop to publication which led to the case in the Supreme Court. On June 26, the Supreme Court heard the case, New York Times uh, Company versus the United States. On June 30, 1971, the Supreme Court held in a 6-3 decision that the injunctions were not, were, were un, were, excuse me, were unconstitutional due to the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, advocating the right to free speech. In the 1960s, Kennedy and Johnson appointed the four Supreme Court justices. No wonder it was a 6-3 decision. Pentagon uh, Papers Fact 20. Daniel Eckberg was charged with theft, conspiracy, and violation of the Espionage Act for leaking the Pentagon Papers. But his case was dismissed as a mistrial when evidence emerged about wiretapping and break-ins that had been ordered by the government. Pentagon Papers Fact 21. The Pentagon Papers were published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and various other newspapers and caused outrage and uproar with the American public. Pentagon Papers Fact 22. The publication of the Pentagon Papers confirmed many suspicions about the credibility gap between what the government said and what we actually did. Pentagon uh, Papers Fact 23. The significance of the Pentagon Papers heralded a new era of skepticism about the Vietnam War and the United States government in general. Pentagon Papers, Fact 24. The end of the, end of the Vietnam War came with a ceasefire agreement on January 27, 1973, in U.S. military involvement in the war. A total of 2.5 million Americans had served their country in the conflict, during which 58,307 American troops were killed and 304,000 were wounded, of which 75,000 returned home severely disabled. In reality, the war ended with the Democratic Congress bailout and betrayal in order to finance their social victories at home. Pentagon Papers, Fact 25. The government sanctions of wiretapping and break-ins surrounding Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers were later mirrored in lies and deception of the Watergate scandal, which led to the downfall of President Nixon. All the dishonesties from the Gulf of Tonkin Revolution to the end of the war brings credibility to Victor Lasky's book. It didn't start with Watergate. He said they decided they would get Nixon if they could, and so it happened that the Democratic Congress and the media elites colluded in what amounted to a coup d'etat, the first and so far the only one in American history, Lasky stated. That Watergate was mainly a media event, points to Democratic scandals which had been relatively ignored, and claims that leading Democrats were fully aware of, the, of plans for the break-in and did nothing to prevent it. If you read Victor Lasky's book, you will understand the real lies and deception of the Watergate scandal. Pentagon Papers, Facts 26. The Pentagon Papers were finally declassified and released on June 13, 2011. The National Archives has the following introduction to the Pentagon Papers on their site. The Pentagon Papers, the official title report of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, the Vietnam Task Force, was commissioned by Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara in June of 1967. In June of 1971, a small portion of the report was leaked to the press and widely distributed. However, the publication of the report that resulted from these leaks were incomplete and suffered from many quality issues. 
Are the 26 found in today's history of the students' Pentagon Papers really facts? Or the real reason for, one, commission of the Pentagon Papers? Two, leaking of the papers in 1971. We know now it was Johnson's war and he had not been honest. Johnson, McNamara, and their circle of managers politicized, misrepresented it, and mishandled the war. Those failures cannot be shared with or blamed by on anyone else. So let's cut to the chase and expose the Pentagon Papers maliciousness. And the 26 facts in today's biased account of the students' Pentagon Papers for what it truly is, a far-fetched deception and alibi for failure, and a forged passport to escape accountability like the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, the Pentagon Papers was a deliberate intent to deceive. And now for some reason, it's not changing again. Well, it's changed. Now I don't hear you. All right, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and close it up. Um, anyway, um, folks, this was a rant by another Vietnam vet. Uh, this is his thoughts on the war. I, I, th <clears throat> I think overall, for me personally, I think his facts are, are good. But I don't think there's one dem one one political party uh, deserves to blame a whole lot more than one of the, than the other. Uh, some people see this as just a, um, a political thing. Uh, the whole Vietnam War was a political thing. But uh, I, I think both parties were complicit in what was going on. Uh, both parties had to vote. As far as uh, uh, the promises we kept we were to close out the, uh, the peace treaty was to, uh, we were supposed to continue assisting South Vietnam. When Nixon left office and Gerald Ford took over, he went to Congress and said, okay, this is the promise that we gave in the uh, peace talks for South Vietnam, we'd give them this money. Not only would Congress not give the money that was promised, some congressmen got up and walked out of the uh, of the meeting. So uh, I understand uh, Tom's ranting, and I agree with him. Uh, I just don't think it's all one side. Uh, let me know what you thought, what you think about it, and so forth. Uh, it's an interesting subject. I really enjoyed reading his part. If you got something to say about it, send it to me. We'll put it on the show if you want to. If not, just tell me not to, but give me your thoughts. But this is uh, this is uh, Tom's uh, rantings, and I thought I was really good. By the way, uh, as I mentioned before, this coming Friday, which is February 12th, is Operation Homecoming. That's the day they started bringing uh, all the prisoners home. There were several different plane loads. Uh, Supposedly, the, the, the people who were captured first who had been in prison longest were the ones who came home first. So uh, that was the, uh, the way they came home. But Operation Homecoming began in 1973, Friday the 12th. So thank you for jo and joining the show. And we will uh, probably go over a little bit of this on our next show. Uh, but then we'll go right into our next show. Our next show is 24th of February. If you enjoyed the show, you have some comments, please let me know. Let's talk about uh, on the show, on next show just uh, what you think about this. Uh, I've had some people who were historians uh, say it was really good, uh, most of it, but it was some few things. Uh, I've had people say that it was set up by uh, to put down the Democratic Party. Uh, before, I, I, that may have been what Tom had, but I, I don't think it's, uh, I think the overall idea is is a real thing so uh on my screen i am frozen but that's okay my mouth's not quite frozen yet but uh, uh let me know what you thought and tell your friends what what you saw and, and get their thoughts and have them come back on the show again thank you for tuning in i hope you learned something tonight i hope it uh, uh stirred you a little bit to uh, get out and learn some more about the vietnam war because you can see right there it is badly misunderstood and misreported Thank you all and have a great evening and look out for the cold weather. We're all supposed to be getting uh, this coming weekend. Uh, have a nice Valentine's Day and I will see you on the 24th. Thank you and good evening.
are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.